Your mission is to measure the refractive index of this. A simple glass slide. We'll do this with a Michelson interferometer. What needs to be done here is a lot like a more familiar experiment for many physics majors, and that's measuring the index of refraction of a gas using a Michelson interferometer. In that experiment, a Michelson is set up. You have mirror one on the short leg, mirror two on the long leg. Laser beam comes in, it hits a beam splitter, goes to the two mirrors, bounces back, and heads on to a screen where, after being expanded, you can see fringes of some sort, whether they're bullseye or parallel. And to do the experiment, you change the pressure of the gas in the cell, thus raising the index of refraction from 1 to whatever it is at the pressure where you end, which presumably is atmospheric. And that's that continuous change of the pressure in the cell that permits this measurement, because as the pressure is increasing, the fringes out on the screen are expanding, and you count how many expand to see how many extra wavelengths of optical path length have been added to path 2. In our experiment, where the sample isn't a gas that you can continuously change just by bleeding it into a chamber, but it's rather a solid, we have to think of a different approach. The glass thickness does determine the final phase out at the projection screen, and if the thickness changes, the phase out of the projection screen will change. So how are we going to do this? So to do this experiment, I propose that we put the slide in the path of the laser beam and then slowly increase the thickness of the glass and count the fringes as they pass by. Smart. So I'm going to use a rotation stage from Newport. This is model 472. It includes a micrometer adjust with a vernier scale that rotates the stage very slowly. And on this stage, we will put our sample. I'll mount the glass slide on this machined aluminum holder. It has a slot down the middle. The slide fits right in there, and set screws will make it tight. And I set it on top of the rotating stage mount so I can turn it. I'm going to turn the micrometer. Using the rotation of the glass as the means for changing its thickness, a little analysis on optical path length in the Michelson interferometer should result in the index of refraction of that glass. Glass has a thickness, capital T. Light is incident on the glass with an angle relative to the normal of theta, and then propagates through the glass a distance L sub g, length in the glass, at an angle, theta sub r, the refraction angle, and then it emerges from the glass at the same angle that it entered. Three important considerations are that the light goes through the glass, and while it is going through the glass, it is not going through air. So you have to subtract from the optical path length the distance it would have propagated through the air. And another important consideration is that light refracts at the interface. If you leave out any of these three important considerations, you won't get the right answer. Beginning with refraction, write Snell's law at the point of incidence, replace sine theta sub r with cosine of theta sub r, and invert that thing, solving it for the refraction angle. The optical path length, L sub g in the glass, is found from some simple trigonometry. You just take that thickness, t, and divide it by the cosine of that refraction angle, writing with Snell's law in mind. That accounts for the propagation through the glass. Now what about the fact that while light is propagating through the glass, it's not propagating through air? The distance the light would have gone along that path is the bottom leg of this triangle. Use that in our expression, L sub g times cosine of theta minus theta refraction, to give the overall optical path length in leg 2, L2 prime. L2 is the physical distance from the mirror to the beam splitter. It's the optical path length the light would have had if there were nothing there. Subtract from that the path that the light would have taken if the glass weren't there at all, and then add to that the path that the light ended up taking as a result of the glass being present. That looks like an easy enough expression, except that it has things like theta minus theta refraction in it and L sub g. We have some expressions we can rely on now, above the expression for L sub g and what we discussed about the refraction angle from Snell's law. So if we put those things together in this expression and do a little bit of algebra, it's just about two lines of algebra to come up with this expression for the optical path length along leg 2 in terms of the tilt angle of the glass and the index of refraction. How do you turn that into an experimental result? 
you have to consider that difference in optical path length between the two legs, L1 and L2. Call that 2 times L2 prime minus L1. The 2 is there because light goes down from the beam splitter, hits the mirror, and comes back. So it goes through each path twice. And as you rotate the glass, there will be a change in optical path length difference. Delta, delta OPL. So it's that expression 2 times L2 prime minus L1 at the end of the rotation minus what it was to start with. If that change in optical path length difference equals one wavelength of light, then one fringe will pass by out on the screen. If it's a bullseye, they will be expanding from the center of the bullseye. If they're parallel fringes, they'll just be passing by from left to right, top to bottom. So overall, the change in optical path length difference is the number of fringes times the wavelengths. And we'll set that equal to this f of theta, final minus initial, where f of theta is my abbreviation for L2 prime minus L1. But I need an expression for f of theta. So take everything that we know and do a little more algebra, and you can come up with this expression for f of theta. That's L2 prime minus L1, using everything that we worked out from Snell's law and the triangles. Calculate f of theta with the final theta that you end up with, and with the initial theta that you started out with. Count the number of fringes that pass by, that's big N, and from that calculate the refractive index little n. Easy. Uh-uh. This is probably the most transcendental equation you've ever seen. Look at where this index n that you want to solve for is buried. Inside of a radical, inside of an arc cosine, inside of a cosine, and then outside of the cosine and inside this radical. Have a good time inverting that equation. Well, I won't. I'll resort to numerical methods. Basic approach is measure the number of fringes, big N, and then calculate what big N lambda should be for a whole table full of little n values and find the value of little n that best matches n lambda. I have this little MATLAB code that pulls off that stunt fairly well. First, the user will input the thickness of the glass and the initial and final angles in degrees and the number of fringes that were observed and the wavelength of the laser. If you type help rotating Michelson, it'll print this information. First, convert the angles into radians. And we're going to do 10,001 steps to find a whole array of refractive indices, n, using lint space, ranging from 1.3 to 2.2 and 10,000 steps. There's going to be several vectors, and they should all be initialized. They don't have to be, but it makes the code run more efficiently because then the vector size doesn't keep changing. The thickness and the wavelength have to be in the same units. So let's convert wavelength from nanometers into millimeters. Now, I learned how to program in the 80s, so when I write a computer program, it looks like Fortran, and it's very loopy. I have a for loop. First, calculate f of theta for the whole table of refractive indices from 1.3 to 2.2. And I broke that equation up into three lines and do it again using the initial value of angle and then take the difference. That difference divided by the wavelength should be the number of fringes. And I say absolute value because I don't know if f of theta final is larger or smaller than f of theta initial. It depends on which way you went in your experiment. So let's just take an absolute value, then calculate the difference between the observed number of fringes and this f of i. And again, absolute value on that. Whatever value of refractive index from this lin space command gives a difference closest to zero wins. I just put this unnecessary plot command in here so that you can see what this looks like. Normally, I have that commented out. Finally, I find the index I'm in that gives the smallest value of that difference, closest to zero. That's the array index that corresponds to the refractive index, which is calculated in the very last line then, indexes. That member of the n array that is at array index of I'm in. The interferometer is set up here with a helium neon laser, a beam splitter, and two mirrors. And in the long path length is a glass slide on a rotating pedestal. When the beams recombine, they go down to a beam spreader. And from there, the spread out beam goes to a screen on the wall where we will be able to observe the fringes.
The recombined beam shows up on this piece of paper that I'm using as a screen, and you can see the fringes. They're very clear. And those fringes are a function of the optical path length of each one of those legs, and that's what we're going to vary by rotating the glass slide. The holes on the optics bench are one inch apart, so we know the distance in millimeters of each leg. Starting with the laser beam normal to the slide, we're going to call that theta equals zero. I'll start to rotate it slowly, and we'll count the fringes going by. That's five degrees, six degrees, seven degrees, eight degrees, nine degrees, ten degrees, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Using that data with the MATLAB function rotating Michelson, I input the sample thickness of 1.27 millimeters. The initial and final angles of 9 degrees and 29 degrees, 177 fringes were measured at a wavelength of 633 nanometers. And the function spits out an index of 1.5691. Now remember that plot command that was in the code. That will help me to explain to you what is happening here. The value of this function f minus the number of fringes is 0 if f was calculated with the actual index of refraction. So graphing f over the entire array range versus the refractive index for each one of those array elements will reveal the true refractive index because that function hits zero at the refractive index. By using absolute value signs, it's a little easier to see. Instead of this passing through zero, it bounces off of zero at a value of about, oh, that looks like 1.5691 can look up really close and actually see that that's in fact where it bounces off of zero. It's worth benchmarking all of this as well. My student from a few years ago, Zach Kellner, did this experiment first and actually developed this method of using the rotating sample on the Michelson interferometer for us to use in the future. And he tested it with sapphire. The book value index for sapphire is 1.7659 for ordinary rays, and it's 100 oriented with a polarized laser beam, so that's what I will expect. Zach concluded that the index of refraction from his measurement was 1.80 plus or minus 0.05. Now this brings up an important thing. As you do your experiments, the uncertainties need to be analyzed and minimized. Perhaps you can get a smaller than 0.05 with repeating your measurements and averaging and being meticulous and careful with accounting. Certainly don't do it the way I did it by video recording the fringes going by and then attempting to count them. Be sure to avoid micrometer backlash because that adds a miscount to your number of fringes. And avoid regions where counting is difficult, such as near the extremes of 0 and 90 degrees. I went from 9 to 29 in my measurement. Perhaps 9 was too close to 0, and maybe I should have started at 20 and gone to 40 or 50. Okay, that should warm you up for doing this experiment. Everything is totally taken apart and disassembled, and you need to go in the lab and find the parts and do this experiment. Don't just measure a piece of glass or the piece of sapphire. Do something interesting and new for the rest of us to look at.